I gotta say, of every expectation I might have had for a sequel to that 2014 Godzilla flick that surprisingly few people seemed to actually enjoy at the time, one of the furthest things from my mind was Avengers but for Kaiju. But if you saw that coming, well, I want your drugs. It's awesome, but wow, that's pretty out there. <laughs> No, really, there are actually a lot of Avengers comparisons to be made with this one. Not the least of which is that at some point they repurposed Monarch into just a straight-up shield for Toho monsters, but amped up to the nth degree. I mean, Nick Fury had a helicarrier? These guys have an oil rig and more locations than goddamn Subway. So, Godzilla 2! No Gareth Edwards this time, directorial duties instead fall to Michael Dougherty, he's a Brian Singer alum who wrote like X-Men 2 and then decided he hated us all and wrote X-Men Apocalypse, presumably whilst riding a bus or something. He also directed Trick or Treat, which rocked, and Krampus, which was pretty damn good. But pay attention to those, because the horror thing's coming back later. It's now like real time, five years on from the events of Godzilla, and the world has essentially settled into that siege mentality from the opening of the first Pacific Rim, you know, we know monsters exist, they can come back and smash us all to pieces anytime they want, the government wants to nuke them all in their sleep, the scientists who study them are pro-life and think they keep balance in the natural order, and there are some eco-terrorists in the middle of them because even Godzilla movies have to include vegetarians. The leader of those, played by Charles Dance, has designs on resetting the natural order by enslaving the monsters who are now called the Titans, as in the mythical Titans, by using like a man-made sound-based dog whistle device called the Orca, because subtlety don't belong here, clearly. Enter Monarch, remember those guys? So yeah, the uh, the clandestine monster hunters from the first movie in like Kong Skull Island, which uh, gets name-checked a lot here, by the way. Uh, they're now just S.H.I.E.L.D. They've got Quinjet, secret bases, teams of scientists, and equipment so potentially dangerous you'd never in a million years actually build it, and even a Ken Watanabe, naturally. Their only way to stop Charles Dance? To essentially get Godzilla to fight for them, taking down not only the minor legacy characters that pop up along the way, but the lightning-firing King Ghidorah as well. Millie Bobby Brown is also in this movie, and if it seems like I just tacked that on there, well, uh, that's kind of how the movie works still. In all honesty, King of the Monsters actually isn't bad at all. In fact, it could be argued as the definitive attempt at a big-budget Hollywood Godzilla movie like now and forever. I mean, it won't be, because we all damn sure know that Godzilla vs. Kong's coming our way on the back of this, but if nothing else, it's a least a, a step up for the pretty joyless first movie, and a hell of a leap from that piece of crap 98 Emmerich movie with like Leon and Mo Sislak out in the rain. For the second time in a row, having a horror director on one of these turns out to be the best decision in the world. I mean, sure, the, the script may be a little problematic, and it's far, far too convoluted for a movie that's ultimately about giant monsters biting one another, but uh, the stylistic sensibilities, the visuals, and the way they aesthetically play with the iconography here? Damn, I mean, take a bow, Mike. Less so on the page, he, he co-wrote this with Zach Shields, who he did Krampus with, but hey, at least this one remembers to toss in a chuckle here and there. I mean, it's a movie about giant lizards. Nobody's in need of Dostoevsky here, you know what I mean? Cast-wise, everybody's rock solid. Half the cast don't need to be there, but at least they make a pretty rousing effort while they are. What Nobby's spitting out Zen as if it's a natural byproduct of spittle, and Charles Dance is just a badass 24-7, we all know that, don't be tripping. But uh, Vera Farmia's great, despite her character making increasingly less sense in hindsight, and Kyle Chandler's there because there was a casting void for, you know, some guy, and both Ron Livingston and Jason Clark were presumably busy, 
perfectly solid, even though, again, less sense as it goes on. His character actually, at one point, changes motivations within the space of a single monologue. It's kind of hilarious. I mean, and I couldn't tell you for the life of me why they wrote a teenage character into this in much the same way I have no idea why Elizabeth Olsen was in the last one, except maybe because Stranger Things is a bit cool and, well, they'd really like some of that fan base's money. Billy Boy Brown's, again, really solid though. Pointless, but solid. And I also want to name check like uh, Shay Jackson Jr., Zhang Z, Thomas Middleditch, Bradley Whitford, Sally Hawkins, Anthony Ramos, CCH Pounder, and Aisha Hines too, all of whom at least make their presence felt, even if it is in a movie so ludicrously overstuffed. They somehow managed to bring Joe Morton in to play an older version of Corey Hawkins' character from Skull Island, and they never even get around to acknowledging it. But if you're rocking up to this looking for a character piece, you're kind of in the wrong place to begin with. If Mothra 2K 14's your jam, though. Oh, yeah, step on up. No joke for city leveling kaiju smashing fun. Look no further. I mean, I really can't add more to a review of King of the Monsters than that. If you're the kind of person who can merrily just sit and enjoy giant monsters fighting one another against a backdrop of way, way too many human characters and a stupidly overcomplicated storyline, well, Firstly, you presumably really enjoyed Pacific Rim Uprising, and secondly, welcome to Thunderdome, bitch. Strap in and get some. If that ain't for you, believe me, neither is Godzilla King of the Monsters. It's a two-star movie that's an outright four for its fan base. I'm kind of on the fence there, so it's three for me personally, but yeah, two-star movie. About as divisive in my mind, meanwhile, is Thunder Road, which finally gets its UK release this week. This shares its title with a 1958 Robert Mitchum movie, but is in no way, absolutely anywhere near as badass. It's an adaptation of a short by Jim Cummings. That short, like back in 2016, was about a, a police officer struggling to hold it together whilst delivering his mom's eulogy, and it crescendoed with a dance routine to that Springsteen song. You know, you can probably guess the, the title. Uh, now, after a Kickstarter campaign, it's a, it's a fully-fledged movie. Why? I couldn't possibly tell you, but it's it's here, and hipsters seem to love it. I mean, I thought it was a nauseating, self-indulgent piece of garbage, but eh, to each their own, I guess. This feature adaptation literally opens with either a restaging or the insertion of that original short. I honestly couldn't tell you which. Uh, going on to follow Cummings' character as literally everything about his world falls apart around him. You ever read The Killing Joke and see its whole One Bad Day theology? This is essentially that as a movie. It's decently enough put together. Jim Cummings also wrote and directed and edited it, but good lord is this navel-gazing bilge. It's barely held together by a pretty rousing otherwise turn from Cummings in front of the camera, but even his snot-laden ramblings can't make it work as a fully-fledged flick. It's perfectly possible to take a short film and expand it to something genuinely good. Go and see This Is The End for a masterclass on that one, but this sure ain't one of those. One star, it appeals only to a very specific and irritating kind of cinephile, and yeah, responses to my own Twitter feed have absolutely backed that up. One star for Cummings' efforts, but you lose three for that script. Second week in a row, though? The baller turns out to be Olivia Wilde, so last week she dropped a directorial debut and it was a pretty terrific spin on Superbad, and this week she's back in front of the camera in A Vigilante, and she's leading what can only be described as the feminist art house halfway mark between The Punisher and You Were Never Really Here, and Christ, you just you get three stars from me on that concept alone. In fact, hell, just three stars. Let's, let's, let's call this what it is. So, Wild is Sadie, a woman escaping her own abusive and traumatic past by training up as a one-woman tag team and setting out to help other abuse victims one at a time. Essentially a sort of avenging angel in exactly the same way that Claire Foy was at the opening of uh, The Girl in the Spider's Web last year. There's a little bit more to it than that, and Sadie's got her own demons to face and naturally she'll get there, but the brilliance of a vigilante is in the grit and the minutia rather than the eventual destination. This is all about the journey, though admittedly, that destination's pretty great. Wild's an absolute 
Firestorm offers up a hell of a turn. Writer-director Sarah Dagar Nixon, who's making a feature debut, knows exactly how to sell the, the cold, bleak reality of a story. It's tight, it's gripping, it's uh, compact in a sort of 91-minute package that you will dig. It could so easily have just been spun into a more popcorny, conventional death sentence kind of a flick, but it stands its ground so much more distinctly in the independent art house arena instead. I was really astonished by it, and not even because like the violence or anything. In fact, nearly all of that takes place off screen, but just at the behest of a really arresting performance by Olivia Wilde. So two weeks in a row, Olivia Wilde is our queen. This is a four star flick from me, and good god, the OC just feels like a long time ago now. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, rate, and review.